Specifically, it's some of the common emotions that we deal with and maybe even struggle with. Am I the only person in the place that struggles with emotions from time to time, right? Listen, emotions are one way the enemy uses to take us down. Right. Right? right. Our emotions can get out of control. And so what we're going to do is that, that we're going to become more self-aware through this series. I believe that if we do what we're encouraging you to do through this series... It's going to cause us to become more self-aware of our emotions, what we experience, why we experience it, and identify some ways that we can perhaps tweak our life. We've been talking about that a lot lately, the small tweaks, right? How many of you know that a bunch of small little tweaks adds up to a big change? And if you just make a, a small tweak each week, you'll be doing good. But as we think about the word emotions, one passage of Scripture jumps out at me. I'm going to read it to you in Ecclesiastes 3, verses 1 to 13. One of the most famous passages of Scripture. It's often read at weddings and funerals. But today I'm going to read it to start a sermon series. It says this, For everything there is a season, a time for every activity under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to harvest. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build up. A time to cry and a time to laugh. A time to grieve and a time to dance. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather stones. A time to embrace and a time to turn away. A time to search and a time to quit searching. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear, uh, to tear and a time to mend. A time to be quiet and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. What do people really get from all their hard work? I have seen the burden God has placed on us all. Yet God has made everything beautiful for its own time. He has planted eternity in the human heart. But even so, people cannot see the whole scope of God's work from the beginning to the end. So I concluded, there is nothing better than to be happy, enjoy ourselves as long as we can, and people should eat and drink and enjoy the fruits of their labors, for these are the gifts from God. Eat and drink. Maybe we should just go to lunch. Okay. Let's forget it all. When Solomon writes Ecclesiastes, he, he goes through, he says, meaningless, meaningless, life is miserable and meaningless. He would end the book with a totally different tune that we'll talk about in a little bit. But as I read Ecclesiastes 3, there's so many things that jump out at me. There's so many of these things that we experience in our lives, and they create emotions inside of us. Even as I read it, emotions are bubbling out from you. Everyday, ordinary life is filled with emotions. Flooded with emotions. You really can't do anything about the fact that you're bombarded with emotions. So why do a series on emotions? Because you can choose to not allow your emotions to control you. That's why. So for the next three weeks, we're going to look at this idea. Emotions are this, and this is what we can do with them. And, and the key being, you don't have to be controlled by your emotions. Amen. You can decide that you're going to pay attention to how things make you feel and respond accordingly. Somehow I think we believe this lie that we either ignore more emo emotions and things will get better. How many of you know that doesn't work? Or we allow them to totally dominate our lives and control us to the point where we even, at some cases, become crippled by the emotion. See, ignoring emotions is not the solution, and allowing them to control you completely is not the solution. Have you ever been so overwhelmed emotionally that you couldn't do, say, or even think about anything? Of course, we've all been there. So one of the goals of this series is to become aware of what emotions are meant to do for us, how we can use them instead of being abused by them. 
God wants you to be emotionally happy. John 14, 27 says, I am leaving you with a gift. It's a gift. I'm giving you a gift. You can either take it or you can leave it. How many of you know on Christmas morning, if you leave the presents neatly wrapped around the Christmas tree and you don't unwrap them, you never possess them. I had a friend who gave me a, a, a pair of socks. It was evident that they were a pair of socks. He gave them to me one Christmas season and he said, don't ever open these socks. I held on to those socks for three years. And on every Christmas Eve, I'd send him a picture. And I'd say, don't worry about getting anything this year, bro. I still have it. Three years goes by and he finally says, open the package. And I opened it and they quickly became my favorite pair of running socks. But I didn't possess them until I took the gift. Until I opened it. God has given us a gift. It's a peace of mind and heart. He wants us to be emotionally healthy. He wants us to have a peace in our mind and in our heart, the deepest part of us. He wants us to experience peace. And the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. This isn't a gift that you can buy. It's not a gift that you can earn. This isn't a gift that you can find in a, in a pill. It's not in a bottle. It's not anything but in Jesus. Amen. Says the world cannot give this gift, but Jesus can. You're going to have opportunity, he's saying, to be overwhelmed. You're going to have opportunity to be troubled, to be stressed out, and to pan panic. But guess what? There is a gift. You don't have to live that way. These emotions that are robbing you of peace, of joy, you don't have to live that way. Because there is a gift that He's already given us. He's saying, you're going to have the opportunity to experience fear. Perhaps terror. Or the fear of the unknown. But God doesn't want you to experience those negative emotions. We're going to decide we're going to trust God no matter how bad things look. No matter what things happen. No matter what people say. And it isn't easy, is it? Sometimes I stand up here and I say these things and I'm like, Ben, it isn't that easy. And it certainly isn't natural. When you're going through the deepest, darkest pains, it isn't natural to say, I'm going to trust God and I'm going to experience this peace. See, freaking out is natural. Biting your fingernails to the, to the, you know, until they're gone. That's natural. That's a natural response to stress. Lord, I trust you no matter what. That's not a natural response. That's a response in faith. Amen. Yelling is natural. Gordon was sitting in the drumming thing this morning. He said, I can't hear you. So I started to yell. He says, I can hear you now. You don't have to yell. He said, I want to get it all out. Yelling is natural. But being calm and peaceful, it's not natural. Well, natural isn't always the answer. Yeah. And emotions are natural. In fact, the definition of emotion is this. A natural, instinctive state of mind deriving from one's circumstances, the things that happen to me, from the mood, right? An emotion is a momentary thing. A mood is something you get stuck in. Or relationships with others. Here's the thing. Circumstances. We don't always choose what happens to us. But a lot of times we do. A lot of times circumstances are a result of our own choices. Other times they're not. So we don't control that totally. But our mood is mostly always a choice. You recognize that, right? Amen. You choose your mood. That whole line, change your stinking thinking. Change your mood. I'm sorry that you don't feel good. What are you going to do about it? Relationships. We choose our relationships besides our family. And even in that, we get some kind of a choice. Don't we? We have a choice in this. In all three of the things that emotion is defined by. 
So what are you saying here, Ben? I'm saying that if science tells us that there are three determining factors of emotion, and they're mainly controlled by our choices, I'm telling you we can control our emotions. In researching this, I came across this emotional wheel. And it says for every emotion, there's an opposite emotion. So you have joy here and you have grief. How many of you have experienced both of those? Yeah. We have fear and we have anger. How many of you have experienced both of those? Yeah. Surprise, anticipation, disgust, and trust. Trust me, I'm just disgusted by you. I can't trust you because I'm disgusted by you. We've experienced all of these emotions. And for every one, there's an opposite. The reality is, is that we often live in here, but we can get to the extremes. If you're like me, you can get there quickly. You go from joy to sadness real quick. But we can choose these emotions. You can make the argument that every decision requires an emotional response. So emotions aren't all bad. In order to make a decision, you have to have an emotional and an intellectual response. Usually, we ignore the intellect and we just go with emotional. That becomes a problem, doesn't it? If we're always making our choices on emotions, we're probably making some pretty bad choices. Sometimes we avoid making decisions or doing the inevitable because our emotional response to that and what we have to face is overwhelming. I don't want to do this even though I know I need to do it because it means I'm going to feel this way. That is not good. That is not healthy. However, when we ignore or repress action because of emotion, we never get closure. If you're a person who struggles with closure in your life, chances are you ignore things because of the emotional response you know it's going to give you. Instead, recognize this is probably, possibly, maybe, may cause me to feel this way. And make a plan on how you're going to react to that. But... One thing that we believe that I, I think is really bad at a young age, we're kind of taught this, especially guys, is that emotions are bad. I want to dispel that right now. Emotions are not bad. My father, the six foot five, 300 plus pound giant, taught me that it's okay to cry during a movie. It's okay to cry when you experience pain. It's okay to be angry when things happen. That emotions are a natural response in life. He was a police officer, so obviously he had to learn to block some emotions, right? Because you can't always base every decision off of emotions. But he taught me a very valuable lesson, one that I believe is 100% on point biblically, and that's this. Emotions aren't bad, but how we express them can. Your emotions are never bad. No matter what the emotion is, it is not bad. But how we express that emotion can be. Have you ever just lost it? I mean, like, totally lost it, you know? Whether it was uh, the way you responded, like, with voice, or maybe it was with tears and snot, and, you know? I used to lose it really easy when I was younger. Really easy. I, I told you some stories before. One time I got angry. Driving home, I had a huge IC in my, in my truck. Was, and we had just bought a brand new house and we pulled up and I was so mad. So mad at something just small and trivial. This was a long time ago, by the way. Let's just... <laughs> and I got out of the truck and I said something mean and hurtful, I'm sure. I don't remember what it was to my wife. And I took that IC and I threw it as hard as I could against our house. Left a dent in the garage door. A plastic cup left a dent in the road. I used to have a really bad problem with how I responded to my emotions. I used to be that guy that would punch a hole in the drywall and think he was tough. 
I used to think that someone that would punch a, a cement wall was not smart because they always tore up their hand until I realized the pain of patching up a drywall hole. Have you ever just lost? See, the Lord helped me understand some things that experience emotion isn't bad and it isn't a sin to experience any emotion. Anger is not a sin. But how we express it can be. Emotions aren't bad, but how we express them can be. Romans 12, 15 tells us about the importance of emotion. It says, be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who weep. Match them emotionally. It helps you. It helps them. It's how we get through life. Helps us process life. It helps us support others. Relationships are strengthened. How many of you know that when there's a shoulder to cry on, that relationship is strengthened? Experience the joys and pains of life together. We see this over and over again in the Scripture. We see it over and over again in the life of Jesus. And as we read the words of God, we see that even Jesus experienced emotions. In fact, it's hard to come across a story in the Bible that doesn't express some kind of emotion that Jesus felt. So let's look at some of these examples. The first one. My favorite verse to memorize, John 11.35. Shortest, shortest verse in the Bible. Jesus wept. That's it. And his friend Lazarus had died, and a lot of people would argue over the fact that let's, let's, let's have a debate. Was he crying because Lazarus was dead, or was he crying because he knew he was going to have to bring Lazarus back from heaven? Now, what was it? I don't know. We're not going to argue that point today. What we're going to say is, if Jesus can weep, then real men can cry. Amen. You hear me? Amen. If you've been taught that you're a man and you can't cry, I want you to get over that jump. If Jesus wept, you can too. Jesus experienced emotions. Another time, Jesus caught people using the temple for business, for personal gain. They were selling things inappropriately, charging extra money for these sacrifices. And Jesus, he gets a little upset in Matthew 21. Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out all the people. And in John chapter 2, he had, it actually says he made a whip to drive them out. That's taking the icy up a notch. You know what I'm saying? His was righteous anger. Mine was not righteous anger. It says he drove them out of the temple. They were buying and selling animals for the sacrifice. He, uh, they they were, um, began to drive out all the people buying and selling animals for sacrifice. He knocked over the tables of the money changers and the chairs of those selling doves. He said to them, the scriptures declare, my temple will be a, called a house of prayer, but you have turned into a den of thieves. Jesus was never afraid of confrontation. Emotions naturally cause us to not want to confront things. But in reality, there's often times where you're going to have to make the decision to step into confrontation. But the reality is, is that Jesus was full of compassion. Matthew 9, 36, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. Let's talk about these crowds. These are people who don't know God. These are people who don't know Jesus. They're following around this dude that's doing all sorts of crazy miracles. And he sees them and it says they have compassion on them because they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. This is where we get that powerful scripture. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. When Jesus saw people who didn't act like him, he had compassion on them. He was not judgmental towards them. He didn't talk about them. He didn't call them names. He had compassion on them. He reached out to them with love. The only people that Jesus ever called hypocrite, my, my record is the religious leaders of the day. What do you see when you see people who don't know the Lord? Matthew 14, we have another example of Jesus and uh, compassion that says, as soon as Jesus heard the news, what news? The news that John the Baptist had been murdered. His cousin, the one that baptized Jesus. 
had been murdered, he hears the news and he's so distraught that all he wants to do is get alone. Have you ever been there? Emotionally, I'm so gone, I'm so far gone that I have to get alone. There is nothing wrong with that. If you need to get alone because emotionally you're a wreck, there is nothing wrong with that. That is not wrong, that is not a sin, and no one should ever tell you that because Jesus did. But there was a problem. The people found out where he was going. And so they followed him. He didn't respond in anger against them. He didn't say, get away from me. Instead, we have some of the most powerful moments in all of Scripture coming ahead of us. Jesus wants to get alone. Don't be surprised if you want to get alone if somebody follows you. And don't discount what God can do in that moment. You hear me? Amen. Emotions are not bad. Sometimes you need to get alone, but don't be surprised when your friend or your loved one follows you. And here is what ends up happening in all of this. Check out these results. Matthew 14, 14. The very next verse, Jesus saw the huge crowd. Not one or two people, but this huge, massive groups of people as he stepped from the boat and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. A few verses later, we have the miracle of Jesus <coughs> multiplying the food, the fish, and the loaves of bread. If Jesus would have just been like, get away from me, I told you, if he would have freaked out, we never would have had this miracle. Instead, they follow him, he embraces them, has compassion on them, begins to heal them, and then... The people, his followers are like, Jesus, we're pretty much sick of all these people going around us. They made an excuse. They're like, they don't have any food. And Jesus goes, well, give them food. Well, Jesus, you were just trying to get along. No, give them food. He feeds 5,000 men plus women and children. And all the dude wanted to do was get along. See, emotions aren't bad, but they can't rule your life. If Jesus would have been allowed the emotion to rule his life, he would have just kept running. Jesus experienced every emotion during this life. And he knows everything that we're going through. Hebrews 4.15 says we have a high priest. A high priest of ours, Jesus. He understands our weaknesses. For he faced all the same testings we do, yet did not sin. Scientists will tell you that emotions are the way that we decide whether or not we should do something. The life of Christ gives us all of these examples. It shows us that experiencing emotions aren't bad. And that we're all going to experience them. That emotions can keep us safe. That they can cause us to take action. But emotions aren't bad. How we respond to them, maybe. But emotions are good. Emotions are good. Psalm 103, verse 1, one of my favorite passages of scriptures. Let all that I am praise the Lord. With my whole heart, with that innermost part of me, I will praise His holy name. I love the New King James Version. It says, bless the Lord, all my soul. To me, that's an emotional passage. No matter what I'm experiencing, no matter what I'm facing, bless the Lord, oh my soul. Yes. Walk out and the tires flat, bless the Lord, oh my soul. Someone writes something bad about you on Facebook, bless the Lord, oh my soul. Even my emotions, yes, even my emotions. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Emotions are critical to the human experience. I'm not trying to say that we need to cut our emotions off, ignore them, or do anything with them, but we must be careful in how we respond to them. We must learn how to express them properly. Yes. I'm so glad that I'm not that out of control 19, 20, 21 year old that had no clue of how to express them properly. We still slip up from time to time. Can I get an amen in the house? Amen. But we must learn how to express them. 
property, I believe. And I just heard a collective, uh-oh. Right? I mean, basically, if you're breathing in this place, you may have some work to do here. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me. I got some work to do here. Expressing emotions properly is the challenge of our lifetime. Proverbs 29 11 says this a fool, a what? There ain't no fools at crossroads. A fool gives full vent to his spirit, but a wise man quietly holds it back. A fool gives vent to his spirit. Guilty. That spiritual vomit. Blech. I'm just so frustrated. Let me tell you all about it. Blech. You'll never believe what happened. Blech. You'll never believe what they did to me. Blech. The Bible tells us, listen, it's okay to express your emotions. It's okay to talk about your emotions. But you probably shouldn't give full vent to anything. When you do, it can cause you to sin. So we need to learn to hold them back. Not necessarily repress, not hide them, not ignore them, but hold them back. So you don't have to verbalize every complaint that you have. Ben, I'm talking to you, Ben. You don't have to express every single thing that frustrates you. We know someone's driving in the left-hand lane five miles an hour under the speed limit. <laughs> we know someone's sitting at a stoplight on their cell phone. What good is it going to do to vent? All it's going to do is take away the joy that you have. Amen. See, when you worry about something so small and insignificant, you can derail your whole day. And when you derail one day, you can derail the next day. And it becomes a pattern that you repeat over and over again, and it allows misery to creep into your life. Decide today that there is more important things in this life than the little things that make you upset. See, life is a precious gift. Don't waste it on the little things. The little things that don't matter. But spend it on the little things that do. Embrace your family. Phone a friend. Give someone a compliment that you really mean. Be love. Be grace. Anger can be one of the most destructive emotions. And we're not going to spend a lot of time looking at a specific emotion today. I told you we're going to define an emotion. We're going to talk about what they are, which we have done. But I could not ignore this emotion. I felt led to talk about this one specifically. Because this is one that can't win. Some emotions are stronger than others. And I believe this one has the potential to derail us quicker than any of them. Ephesians 4, 26 and 27 says, And don't sin by letting anger control you. Notice it doesn't say don't get angry. It says don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't act like a fool when you get frustrated by someone. Ben. I'm not going to call on anybody else's name. because I'm not that type of, of guy. But I'm just saying. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry, for anger gives a foothold to the devil. Yeah. It's been my experience that when I've been angry, if I repress my feelings, it gets worse. But if I talk with the person responsible with the frustrations, I don't want to say every time, but most of the time, the results have been a strengthening, a bonding, a welding together of a friendship that is biblical. The Bible says if you have an issue with someone, you are to go to that person and talk to them, not talk about them to everybody else. 
It doesn't give any kind of qualifying measure for that. It doesn't say, if they really did you dirty, it's okay. You can just share all the good news about them to everybody else. It says, if somebody has sinned against you, go to that person. And then if they don't listen to you, take two or three witnesses with you. Not to gang up on them, but to officiate. And if the case is that you're angry, you're frustrated with someone, chances are you need to talk to them. And preferably to the one that caused it. Or perhaps today you need to forgive yourself. There's been some things in life that have happened and you are the only person that you can find blaming. And that's okay. As long as you don't hold on to it. Because that can produce a spirit of anger within you that can ruin your life. Not to mention the lives of everyone around you. Choose today to forgive yourself or someone else. Ask God to forgive you and let go of the anger that you're experiencing. Proverbs 16.32, it, it, it tells us what we should do. It says, he who is slow to anger, he who is what? Slow, slow to anger is better than the mighty. And he who rules his spirit, then he who takes a seat. It's saying if you can control yourself, you're more powerful than an army that can take overthrow a city. This is a big deal. This matters. Our emotions are very real. They cause us to do things. They cause us to not do things. But in the end, the Bible tells us we need to hold them back. We need to learn to process our emotions. Use them as the gift that God intended for them to be. <clears throat> because when we experience emotions, we typically express them. And if we improperly express emotions, that can be very, very ugly. Can I get an amen? amen. Very ugly. We've had those moments. We've all had those moments. Maybe it's screaming or swearing. Maybe it's something insignificant that you turn into a huge deal. All because emotions escalated in your life. But whatever the case may be, expressing emotion improperly can be very ugly. Which is why this message is called the good. Emotions are good. The bad. But how we express them can be bad and the ugly. Because if we do it improperly, it can be very ugly. Very ugly. Proverbs 15, 18 talks about what happens when we express emotions improperly. It says, a hot-tempered person starts fights. A cool-tempered person stops. <laughs> Someone who has control of their emotions can stop disagreements. We want to learn to hold back our negative emotions, to process them properly, and become the person that stops fights, not starts them. The holidays are coming. Thanksgiving is coming. For some of us, that means WrestleMania 99. <laughs> Our dinner table resembles an over-the-top battle royal. But that's because before, we didn't put our emotions in check. This year, we're going to commit to becoming the person that God wants us to be, to holding back the negative emotions, to thinking about them, processing them, and understanding them better. And we're going to experience a great holiday season. This time of year, it is easy to lose it emotionally, isn't it? All right, let's be honest. Every time of the year, it's easy to lose it emotionally. It's a struggle day by day. And that's because life can be an emotional roller coaster. This morning, as I was going over this point, I had to take out the red pen. And I had to do one of these right here. Life is an emotional roller coaster. It doesn't matter how you deal with your emotions, it's an emotional roller coaster. And while the human side is full of up and downs, it's important anytime that you're talking about emotions to understand that God doesn't want us to experience a roller coaster ride. But rather, 
ultimately, God wants us to experience joy. God wants you to experience joy. It doesn't matter what kind of thing you're going through. It doesn't matter your circumstance. It doesn't matter what's going on with other relationships. God wants you to experience joy. And lasting joy only comes only comes through a relationship with God. It's the only way you can have lasting joy. Life is so uncertain, so full of ups and downs. If you base your joy on anything but God, you are going to find yourself coming up short all the time. Because the only thing that you can find true joy in is a relationship with your Lord and Creator. <laughs> See, when we're separated from God, we experience a robbery of the joy He intended for us to experience. So is it possible that your emotions have robbed you of the joy that God intends for you to experience today? Is it possible that these little things that drive us crazy are robbing us of the joy that God wants us to have? Absolutely, which is why we need to take control of our emotions by trusting Jesus. By saying, you know what? I know that Romans 8.28 says all things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to His purpose. I can trust God's Word. This book is not just some book. This is God's Word. I believe it. Says what it says. And I have what it says I have. And it says I have the joy of the Lord and that is my strength. That's all I need. I'm going through a rough time. I have the joy of the Lord. I can have joy while enduring pain. No matter what you experience, no matter what your mood you find yourself in, no matter what happens in your relationships with others, today make the choice you're going to choose to trust in the Lord. Amen? Amen. Let's pray.